So good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining on this session of Blue Carbon and what it can do for us. So as Ian said, my name is Dr. Claire Evans. I'm a senior research scientist at the National Oceanography Centre, and I'm a biogeochemist, which means I study the, um, all the processes that influence the flow of elements through the environment. So first things first, what do we mean when we talk about blue carbon? Well, the blue part, let's see if this is gonna, sorry, one sec. Hopefully you can see planet Earth on your screen now. So the blue part, of course, refers to the marine environment. And when I'm thinking about the marine environment, this is everything out to the deep ocean, right, out, right towards the land and the areas that are influenced by the salty water of the sea and all the soils or sediments below them. And when I'm thinking about the carbon part of blue carbon, this is the carbon contained in the bodies of all the marine organisms. And these range from the very tiny microscopic phytoplankton you see here, which are ubiquitous throughout our oceans, right through to the largest creatures on the planet. And we have this beautiful whale here and everything in between. So and this includes not only the biomass in living organisms, but also those organisms which have died and their parts of their bodies have been incorporated typically into the sediments. However, in recent years, the term blue carbon has become to be associated with um, particular types of habitats. And these are the coastal vegetated habitats, which you see here. And primarily these are the sea grasses the mangroves and the salt marshes. Now these environments have received considerable focus um, as stores of marine carbon for a number of reasons. Firstly, they're extremely productive. They grow very fast and they incorporate or fix lots of carbon dioxide. And this is through the process of photosynthesis, which is the same as land plants would do. And if you look at them, they're also constructed of lots of uh, frond type uh, leaves and also roots and stems that create a network or a web of uh, particle or fibers running through the water column. And in doing this, what they do is as the current flows past, they actually slow down the water. And so what happens is any particles or any bits of material that are in the water column actually gets more likely to settle out in these areas. And so bits of their own biomass, the leaves, and also inputs from rivers or the coastal ocean settles out and gets deposited in their, their uh, sediments below. And actually, once this material is deposited in the, um, the, the sediments below the uh, mat of vegetated material, it becomes incorporated into this saturated, salty environment, where instead of being broken down by other organisms and then that carbon or carbon dioxide being re-released to the atmosphere, instead it accumulates there beneath these uh, uh, plant species. And this forms dense deposits of carbon um, which can be meters thick. You can see here, this is a seagrass bed. You see the roots extending into the sediments below and these dense carbon stores building up. So we can have meters and meters of carbon. And from dating this, we know that the carbon can be up to millennia uh, old. So it's really uh, um, storing that carbon over very long time scales. And actually these blue carbon habitats are really effective at capturing and storing the carbon. In fact, some of them are much, much better than the habitats on land. And they typically contain about two to five times the amount of carbon that you might find in the equivalent area of a terrestrial forest. And so um, they are extremely valuable in that regard. Now, another reason why we started to focus on these habitats um, in particular, so these coastal vegetated habitats, is that we believe when they are lost, all of this carbon, these significant carbon stores that have built up underneath them and being locked up underneath them, have the potential to be re-released to the atmosphere. 
And so this could potentially contribute to the buildup of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Now, this is a particularly unwanted effect as it will exacerbate the buildup of um, greenhouse gases that's occurred as a result of us burning fossil fuels over the last century. And this is where we're conver converting long dead biomass that was buried in the earth um, and releasing it back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. And also um, adding to the emissions that we've created from land use change as well. So typically cutting down forests to make way for activities such as agriculture or development. And this is a process that's being seen around the world, but it's particularly pre prevalent in the belt of tropical forests. And here we see an example on the slide where you can see you would have had traditionally peat swamp forest in this region, which is the, the forest in the lower section of the slide. And this has been cleared to make way for the cultivation of palm oil. And in order to then cultivate the palm oil, what they have to do is drain the land and then this makes all the um, soil carbon stores vulnerable to being um, metabolized and fluxing back to the atmosphere. So we know that this problem is critical as changing atmospheric composition is currently perturbing the Earth's system in terms of its functioning. So we're having more extreme weather patterns, our oceans are acidifying, and we are um, having the loss of polar ice caps due to warming temperatures, which is causing sea level rise. So when we consider the importance of keeping the carbon locked up in these habitats, it's worrying to learn that these marine vegetated habitats are currently the most threatened ecosystems on the planet. And a combination of factors is leading to their demise all around the world. Firstly, when we think about mangroves, so they tend to occur in these beautiful tropical coastal beach type environments. And this land is viewed as very valuable for tourist infrastructure and also the development of um, high value homes and condos and so. And also what we see is in large uh, tracts of the world, there's a switch towards increased aquaculture uh, um, aquaculture production of protein, and so the mangroves are cleared to make way uh, for these activities. And we know that um, with the salt marshes, they too are often drained to make way for um, developments or for pasture land. And with the seagrasses, we know that they're in decline, uh, predominantly due to poor water quality. So this is um, farming practices cause the runoff of nutrients and other industrial processes cause uh, poor water quality running from the land into the coastal ocean. And this destroys the seagrasses along with um, other factors such as fishing and um, even recreational processes. So the image you see on the slide here is actually a mangrove that is um, being cut and drained. And um, you can see that that tangle of roots that would have bedded down into the sediments and helped to stabilize them is gone. And of course, the, the, all that organic material which would have been locked up beneath those, uh, that mangrove is now exposed and will be available to be broken down by microbes that will convert it back to greenhouse gases. So the importance of halting this trend for destruction is clear. So aside from contributing to the problem of global change by damaging these blue carbon habitats, they also offer us um, part of the solution to combating greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So the coastal zone could be managed to conserve these habitats, which is really important to preserve the carbon that is still there. So we prevent the release of any more carbon by further destruction. And also more recently, there's a number of initiatives to restore these habitats where they have previously been lost. So on the slide here is an example of seagrass that is being cultivated in a laboratory from seeds collected from seagrass in the wild. And these have been successfully transported back onto the seabed where they thicken up again and start to form these dense seagrass meadows. And also um, the, whoops, there are a number of issues to a number of initiatives, sorry, um, also to restore uh, mangroves. So you can see 
um, in large tracts of Southeast Asia, there's loads and loads of, of initiatives to do this. And so that, that's going quite well. And the ability to restore these habitats provide um, what has been coined a nature-based solution, which can contribute to solving the problem of climate change, as expanding these habitats could lead to greater rates of natural carbon fixation and capture within those sediments. And to me personally, I feel the restoration of existing uh, um, habitats which can do the job, uh, perhaps a more appealing solution than introducing some kind of artificial mechanism to do it. So, so I think this is a really good way forward. So when we consider the benefits habitats bring, such as in this case, carbon capture, what we're thinking about is ecosystem services. And these are defined as the direct and indirect contributions of ecosystems to human well-being and that have an impact on our survival and our quality of life. And for marine vegetated habitats, carbon capture and storage is just one of the myriad of benefits they bring. So indeed, these environments are key to an array of ecosystem services, which help to keep our world a safe and healthy place to live. So taking you back to the structure of these plants, so I remember I said that the roots and the frond-like leaves actually reduce the, the flow of water and cause this sedimentation of material from the water column. Now, this could also help to deal with the threat of sea level rise. So obviously, as sea levels rise, what happens is they inundate the coast and um, uh, progress further inland. But actually, if you have um, vegetated habitats all around your coastline that can actually build up the seabed through the acquisition of um, these kind of sedimentary materials, then obviously this could keep pace potentially with sea level rise and help to mitigate that harmful effect. Also, of course, when we have this vegetated material around the coast, what's happening when waves are, are coming onto them is that they reduce the energy contained in those waves and thereby they provide some protection against storms and storm surges, um, which would otherwise be quite damaging in the coastal environment. And of course, as well, with this tangle of roots going down into the sedimentary material, um, this actually helps to stabilize that material. And so it prevents erosion in um, vulnerable areas of the coast. And seagrass, as you see here, they are particularly effective at this because they um, tend to form in unstable sediments. So they really help to stabilize the, the seabed. So of course, as well, these environments are absolute havens for marine life. So many marine species have their juvenile stages in these kind of coastal uh, uh, vegetated habitats. And you can see here, this is an example of a shark, so a charismatic sort of apex predator, but also it's really important as, uh, uh, as for life cycles for things like cod and place. So the sort of fish that we might um, consume and certainly forms part of the economy. And it's not just um, commercial species as well, it's uh, many different um, components of the marine ecosystem have some kind of uh, stage that relies on um, the presence of these uh, coastal vegetated habitats. So they're vital not only in the, the support of these commercial uh, fish stocks and endangered marine species, and also they form directly uh, a source of food for some charismatic species like the dugong, which is one of my favorite, as well as things like turtles and around the UK, uh, um, seahorses are particularly dependent on our uh, seagrasses. So furthermore, as well as maintaining this biodiversity in the oceans and um, helping to maintain the, the uh, diversity of marine life, if you like, they also help with our water quality in terms of soaking up excess nutrients and taking out of the water any kind of um, sedimentary material. Um, so by keeping that clarity of the water as well. Now this can actually um, help and prevent things like harmful algal blooms. So as we've had increased um, farming over the last century, we have the tendency to fertilize the land and then a lot of this is washed into the rivers or uh, directly into the coast via runoff 
and this actually stimulates harmful algal blooms. And these can actually smother the coastal environment, create toxins, or even just dead zones where basically you just end up with a lot of rotten dead material. And so having these vegetated coastal habitats really helps to combat those kinds of problems. So another thing that's becoming um, better understood as well is that there, these environments are contribute cultural ecosystem services. So by these, these are, are the non-material benefits that they bring, such as recreation, aesthetic enjoyment, physical, mental health benefits, and for some spiritual experiences. So in this way, they contribute to a sense of place and foster social cohesion. And this is essential for human health and well-being. And given that we might be somewhat restricted in getting access to these environments in person at the moment, here for your enjoyment and well-being is a fly past of a beautiful mangrove. So you might think, obviously, because I've been talking about mangroves and um, exotic things such as dugons, that this uh, this problem or this, this uh, topic, if you like, isn't so important in UK waters. But actually, the UK has a number of blue carbon habitats, um, most notably in terms of their carbon um, bang for your buck are the salt marshes and seagrass. And in fact, seagrass in particular was once a rich carpet around the coast of the UK. However, the poor water quality I mentioned earlier on um, resulting from industry and farming practices has actually seen um, seagrass extent decrease by about 92% or as much as 92%, which is really, really significant. However, the good news is that the legislation, uh, legislation has been brought in to improve runoff and things are improving in our coastal um, seas around the UK. We still have a long way to go, but the UK is becoming a, a suitable habitat for seagrass once again. And in fact, um, UK seagrass restoration is just one of the initiatives at the NOC that we are providing scientific data to support. So this is actually one of my collaborators in Wales where the seagrass restoration is really being pioneered around the globe. So that's something the UK does really, really well. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. And I think we have now um, about uh, 15 minutes or so um, for questions on the presentation or any related topics. And I think if you just pop them into the ch chat, then I'll attempt to, to get through as many as possible or as many as we have. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Now. I, I did, I did, I did. Yeah. I did. Hi Claire, we've got a question that we're asking our presenters today and I'd like to ask you the same question. What inspired you to be an oceanographer? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I think it was um, mainly the adventure of it. So I um, relish the chance to go to sea. There's nothing quite like it. You, you get on a ship with 40 or 60 or whatever people and over the next month or three months or well, the longest I've spent on a ship is six months continuously, actually. So you get on that ship with those people and they become a second family to you and you see things you wouldn't otherwise see and you work really hard and you play really hard and you discover new things about the ocean. So that I think is, I've, I, did, I started out doing it, got hooked on it as soon as I tried it and yeah, I've never looked back. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Um, we do have some others that came in earlier as well for this presentation, if not, so we can always ask those. But if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat box, uh, Claire, and we can answer those. So another one that we've, uh, that's been a popular question today is, if you had the chance to go back to yourself as a 15 year old and give yourself some advice, what would it be? Oh, that's a really good question. I would say pay more attention in your chemistry lessons, I think. Um, I think also, um, I, I wasn't very confident when I was young and I think I would go back and say, stop worrying about it, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, when I was young, I could never imagine doing something like this where I would talk to however many people on, you know, something like this. So um, yeah, just 
and go for it. You know, just don't ever be afraid to try things. Just if you want something hard enough, try for it. There's been a few times in my career where I've made decisions based on um, sort of family circumstances, like moving countries and things, um, which on the surface of things haven't been that great for my career because I've walked away from tenured jobs. However, I've never given up and I've always managed to get another job. And, you know, here we are. So I would say just go for what you want. <laughs> Excellent. So we've yeah, got a, a question in the chat box for you. This is uh, from Christine Gominjinja. Is there anything we can do on a personal level to improve the coastal water quality? Well, that, that's difficult, of course, because I think the major way that um, coastal water quality can be improved is um, through the enforcement of appropriate legislation. And we do, so our legislation's getting better with things like the Water Quality Framework Directive, which I can't remember how many years we've had that now, but that is definitely making um, a big difference. However, there was a report in The Guardian just a few months back where they were testing rivers and they found that still, many, many rivers are not meeting those requirements. And I think it's just a case of, uh, probably with a lot of these issues to do the ocean, it is a great awareness of the general public that then puts that pressure back on government to actually be proper custodians of our environment and safeguard the environment. Because of course, it's not us who decide how effective our uh, sewerage output should be. And I know, for example, in the Solent here, just outside the Knock, um, there's problems with, with relatively untreated storage coming into the water and things like that, and also industrial processes. So a major, major problem as well at the moment, which you would have heard from my colleagues um, earlier on today, I think, is plastics. Because, of course, plastics hang around in the environment. So, you know, there's potentially all kinds of impacts they could be having. So I would say switching to more biodegradable uh, sort of pathways, if you like, <laughs> where, where you avoid these kinds of um, things, but otherwise just, you know, voting for the people who are going to clean, you know, going to do the best and balance uh, environmental concerns with financial and economic concerns. Okay, and we have a question from Paul. Uh, is there a general awareness throughout the world about the value and importance of blue carbon areas or do you think there is more ignorance compared with such things as deforestation so i definitely i i definitely think that there is a bias towards certain habitats so um for example um so so a lot of of what i was talking about was really you know how blue carbon habitats could be used as a nature-based solution to trying to mitigate greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And typically when people think about that, they always think about terrestrial forests. And yet blue carbon habitats are actually much better at it. They sequester carbon um, much uh, faster than terrestrial uh, environments do. Um, and we tend to sort of bias as well towards things like coral reefs, even though the ecosystem services that the coastal vegetative habitats actually uh, give us are probably probably edging it you know they're probably more significant so in terms of throughout the world and and the question of value and, and importance as you might expect it's really variable but the interesting thing is so so i work um with people all around the world on things on related to these kinds of habitats and actually um some of the places that I work where they have the least scientific infrastructure are some of the ones that appreciate the value of these, these ecosystems um, much better than we do here, for example, in the UK. Um, so I think it does really vary. You know, some parts of the Caribbean, they really understand it. Things are really changing in Southeast Asia, although there's a lot of work to do there because there's massive sort of socioeconomic questions to answer. Um, but definitely, um, there, Africa, not so much. There's big holes in our data sets in Africa. And obviously it links towards a number of socioeconomic factors and also awareness. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. 
Hopefully that answers your question for you, Paul. Um, another question that we've put in is why restore blue carbon habitats over green carbon habitats? Oh, yeah, so I sort of um, touched on that, really. So so there's there's a number of reasons. As I say, um, I, I don't think there's any one sort of magic, you know, silver bullet to the, the problems of trying to, to sort out our um, changes in our atmospheric composition. And I, I don't think that, you know, it's an either or situation, it's definitely an and. But I think that whilst there's a lot of focus on the green habitats, we need to consider the blue. And that is because they are faster at sequestering carbon than the green habitats are. So if we want to, something that's going to really give us results fast, then you are far better off restoring a seagrass bed then you are restoring a terrestrial forest. And um, yeah, sorry, what was the other thought that was in my brain? Yes, and of course, so the key thing as well is that what I was trying to get through in the talk was all the other ecosystem services that these things provide. I mean, I could have gone on, you know, <laughs> there really are lots of things that they do. For example, buffering from ocean acidification and things like this. So. Um, I think that is is really why we should uh, consider um, putting more effort into restoring our our blue carbon habitats. 